Moving from theory to reality, theory is a set of beliefs that you don't have proven. And I'm taking my time because I don't want us to get into, you know, if it ain't excited and jubilant, that is not good substance. I want you to, to, to learn to study and enjoy the word of God. Sometimes we'll be doing cartwheels. Sometimes we'll be sitting down listening. Are you understanding me? And so moving from theory to reality, theory is a set of beliefs that's not proven. And then you move to reality, which is a principle to where principle applied. Principle is what? A set of beliefs that has been proven. So we need to move God and our faith from being a theory what we've heard about him, what we even read about him, but what we have not learned about him to move into the realm of learning about him. Why is this important? It is important because that's where the strength of our faith comes in. The strength of your faith comes in what you stand on, what you hold on to, your go-to. You know, some people, their go-to when they're upset, they go to food. When they're upset, some go to some other things. The believers go to, at some point or another, there ought to be something that draws you to what does God say about it. Because truth of the matter is, that's what's going to stand is what God says about it. So we move from there, from theory to reality. And, you know, the first part we talked about, you know, being unwavering in what we know about God, the integrity of his word. We talked about the integrity of his word that when we know God's word is true, we stand on it. Now, there's this journey that goes from theory to reality. It's a journey. You don't come up here, get hands laid on you, or you, you say the sinner's prayer and everything is beautiful. No, there's a journey that you go through from theory to reality. From prophecy to manifestation is a journey. You don't get it, you know, and then all of a sudden you hear it and it's done and then, you know, your life just completely turns around. No, there's a journey. There's a process that that word, that that prophecy goes through the development and manifestation. That journey is where we are now validated as believers. Are you hearing me? It is where we are validated. Now, John 3 and 21 is our focus scripture. I'm taking the time to, to do this. We're not going to be here very long. I'm, I'm, I promise you I'm going to stay on task tonight. Y'all not going to get me off task. John 3 and 21, it says, but he who does the truth comes to the light. That his deeds or his works or the way he handles, the way she speaks, the way they hold firm, you know, is clearly seen that they have been done in God. So, now, we need to look at this journey that does the truth. How do you do the truth? That is the integrity in your faith. Faith is the unknown familiar frontier, I say. Write that down. It's an unknown familiar frontier. I said that purposely for a reason. Is that it is unknown because the, the true essence of faith, many believers don't know. But we think we know what faith is. If I question you, do you have faith? Oh, I, I believe God just like you believe God. I had somebody tell me that today. I believe God just like you. You know, I, I, I don't disbelieve God. But then they were in a position where they did not want to apply their faith. But I believe God. Nobody's questioning whether you believe God. There's a part 
of believing God to acknowledge that he exists. And then there's a part of believe, which is the Greek word pistis, where you are enveloped with what you believe. That not only acknowledge, but you live every part of your life based on what you believe. Your life has to reflect what you say you believe. Faith is looking at whether you live what you say you believe. I believe God for healing. You get a doctor's report, now you're crying, you're calling everybody, you, you know, you, you're already thinking, oh, this thing going to kill me. Is that faith? Now, let me say this. Everybody has a period of a pity party. Everybody gets a period of a pity because everybody's human. At some point, again, something has to kick in to say, I believe God. Are you hearing me? Give me some volume here, please. So what is the goal that I started last week that y'all didn't let me start finish is to be firm in what faith claims is to be firm how are you firm in what faith claims is that you can't look at faith from your perspective you have to look at it from God's perspective how does God view faith so he's the one that gives it 11 Hebrews 11 and 6 says what without faith without faith it is is hard to please God it is very difficult to please God it says it is impossible to please God without faith so now we take faith out of the performance of your beliefs to now resting on this intangible yet tangible asset that we have, which is faith. God don't care what you do <laughs> more than he care about what you believe. Church tried to regulate what you do, and that's failed miserably. Try to control your behaviors with warnings about the word which are misappropriated. Because truth of the matter is, I would rather have someone with me because they love me and not have them with me because they scared to leave me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of being in a marriage because they like what I give them and don't love me. So what makes you think God wants you to claim him if you don't love him and you're not committed to him? Because the thing that you're not committed to, you deduce yourself to where your humanity emerges and now the thing that you don't love you will find ways to act out when you don't think they're watching I want you to follow me so from God's perspective God is saying that without faith it's impossible to please me so now you look at this pistis this fidelis faith and you, you look at it has three components. It has the conviction of the truth of God. You are convicted by his truth. When you read his word, even though you don't want to believe it, you have to accept the fact that it's true. That's number one. Number two, you have a conviction that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is Lord over our lives, and he's the son of God. And number three, Salvation is the full assurance that Jesus is enough. 
Jesus is enough. I don't need to add Jesus to any other ingredient or formula. Jesus is enough. Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm fighting, Jesus is enough. I think that's where it took a turn last week, so I ain't going to stay here too long. Jesus is enough. Not happy in my home, Jesus is enough. I'm troubled about my next move, Jesus is enough. When you have those three components, then now you're on the journey to develop your faith. If you're waiting on your faith to get strong by actions, then you will be sadly disappointed because your heart is, in, is not in the actions you are giving. You're zombies in the, in the church and absent in the body of Christ because your heart is not in it. What counts you present is not the loudness of your mouth, but the presence of your heart. So when your heart is there, then you're able to go through the, the anals and the shifts of where God takes you. And the, the circumstances don't determine your commitment. That's why we're living in a time now where churches, you know, people leave churches because they get hurt. Their feelings, you know, all of that is in the way. Well, what about your faith? That's why people can miss church two or three weeks, and it don't bother them at all. I could miss one service. I, I was preaching somewhere, and I miss being at my home church Sunday. Because I'm like, wonder what is going on now. It's 1054. I bet somebody's up there exhorting. Who was exhorting on, on, on Sunday? Who, who, who did the welcome on Sunday? Oh, yeah, the, the two-way radio chick. And, and then the, 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 the braid chick, yeah, yeah, I got all the reports. See, but when you're missing, you, you, you know, you, you want to know what's going on. If you don't miss, then it makes you question whether you really love. I see my wife every day. And when I'm not here, I miss her. It's not like I forgot what she looked like, but I miss her. I have pictures of her. I have video of her. I have, you know, recordings of her, but I still miss her. To be present enough to feel her heartbeat next to me is something I long for. Same thing with the Spirit of God. When you love God, you miss his presence. You miss being around him. Because you realize that with him, he's enough. Without him, you're missing a whole lot. There's like an empty void when you're not, when you hadn't prayed. You know, you miss him if you pray. You, you miss him because you hadn't talked to him. You know, you can't email God. You can't tweet him. You have to talk to him. <laughs> You miss him. You miss the times when you're reading your devotion and thinking about what he wants to say to you. You miss those times. See, these are things that will make you strong and make your faith firm. Not the, you know, fancy comments on social media by preachers, you know, that don't have no word base to it. It's clever. It's cliche, but it's not powerful. The power comes from the faith and the love that you have for God rooted in the word of God. That's what brings you through. So when you face circumstances, when you face a challenge, then now you could go back to the love of your soul and say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. And they, they, they secure you. They secure you. They, they rescue you. <laughs> All of that is found in faith. It's found in faith. And so God's point of view is understanding it from a larger frame of reference. God is bigger than just what you're going through right now. It's like when your kids come to you, no matter what you're doing, they want you to stop it and, and tend to that need that is scraped up. And tend to that sin. And God is bigger than all of that. So you have to deal with all of it. 
God is looking at it from that perspective. So now, it leads us to the four stages of faith development that all of us go through. And I gave you those, and I'm not going to go through all of them again because that, uh, that's another turn I took. Number one was the new babe stage. Did y'all write? Y'all, how many of y'all got these notes from last week? Because I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, is, the, is the new babe stage. That's the stage where you begin your faith journey. That's when everything is working. You know, theory and reality all mixed up. You don't even care which one is which. As long as you and, you and God and now you saved and everything is wonderful, then you move into now what? You move into now what? The excitement wears off and you're, you're looking for somewhere to rely on the stability. Now you get all committed to church thinking that that's going to, you know, keep the excitement going. <laughs> you know, and now, you, you know, you become rigid. You know, and that's where judgment can come in because now you're judging everybody or you're grading everybody's faith based on their actions. And if they don't line up with yours, then all of a sudden they're way off. They don't know God because, you know, they didn't cry like you cried. And then we move into for real. That's when, you know, I got a lot of, lot of comments. Uh, and for real is that, you know, that's when you start questioning things. And you're actually questioning whether God is really that God. If, if God is really that God, why am I not married yet? If God is really that God, he knows I love him. He knows the desires of my heart. Why, why am I not, you know, rich yet? Why am I still suffering? Why am I still sick? Why am I, you know, and, and maybe God ain't really God. And now, you know, the enemy strategically starts bringing other perspectives in to allow you to, to evaluate against your experience of God and not really against God, but against your experience of God. And so now you start wondering whether there's some loopholes in, in my religion, in my faith. And so maybe they got the right answer. Maybe, you know, they got the right answer. But I don't know if I have the right answer, but, you know. And, and so now you start, you know, kind of all over the place. For real. Pastors go through a for real phase in our faith development. For real. <laughs> and then we move into the all in. Where we have a greater understanding. We break out of the re rebellion and resentment cycle. Because for real is really a re rebellion and resentment. An R&R. &R, rebellion and resentment cycle. And we think we could do certain things and still be in God. And, and all in, you start realizing that God, although, you know, he, he does not, he, he still requires a level of commitment from me in order for him to manifest the way I want him to. He still requires a level of commitment, and I'm willing to give it. He never changed in what he required, but... In some of the other phases, we were not willing to give it because we wanted our own identity and our own independence while we were serving God at the same time. How do I serve God and still be me? And God wants you to stand totally on him. I'm too young to do that. You know, uh, I haven't experienced life. And so all of that goes into our development of faith. Now. Let me <clears throat> bring here is the fact that your faith is not a barometer for your behavior. Your faith is a barometer for your love for God and your commitment to him. Some of us will go through various phases of behavior correction. I will say. I don't even like the term behavior correction because God is not a behavior specialist. <laughs> you know, church is not a behavior center. It's a worship center. <clears throat> and, and the thing that you got to understand, the best way I could tell you about this is 
how I could explain a man. I'll use that because I know what being a man is because I'm one. The more a man loves his wife, the more he's committed and his behaviors align to the love. But the love has to grow to that point to where his behavior aligns to the love. And the whole thing about the love is being in the environment to receive and to give that love. It's a reciprocation of commitment. A man that does not love. He has the propensity to find reasons to be absent from that environment. The thing with faith is in the church, the church tries to, in the church universal, I'm not talking about any particular denomination, church universal, uh, old time faith try to get you to align and act like you love being there when really your love was not as much there as it was still out here in the world. So there's a battle happening. And what happens, it's not that he's not in love, but he hadn't grown to the level of expectation that the bride has. Does that make sense? Is that making sense? So let me show you this, is that some of us gravitate immediately to God's environment. Some of us take a while because we got that wildness in us. We got that, that buck wildness in us. And some of us got that sneaky rebellion in us. All of that exists in here. Some of y'all will say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, to me and prophetess, but you ain't no bit going to do what you've been asked to do because your love is not in the assignment. And some will gravitate immediately because there's some, some children that you never have to spank. There's some children that I know it does exist. I've seen it. I never had it, but I've seen it. There, there's some that you have to spank every now and then, and that'll straighten them out. There's some you could spank all day long, and they'll never, and sooner or later, something clicks, and they're the best behaved, most committed people. I've seen family members. We had a little cousin. I tell you, everybody in the family done beat, you know, that little cousin. You, you remember? Took his grandmama pills and, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Everybody done beat this little cousin. But for some reason, one day, he was the calmest thing in the world. There's some believers like that. The Holy Ghost comes, immediately they gravitate and they're there. The Holy Ghost come in others and it's a dog fight to get them each step that they take. Because they combat and they challenge every facet of faith as to whether they really need to commit to it or not. So what the church does, they condemn or fight with the ones that take a long time and they don't see them as being saved or having gotten it for real. When really in their heart, they really love God. They just, there's something in them that fights to get there. I need you to get this. I need you to get this. They fight to get it. It's not that they don't love God, but they take a little while longer. They need a little bit more conversation. This is where the diversity of parenthood worked in our household because I was like, get there. And my wife was like, well, you know, the <laughs> she can talk them into doing stuff. And to me, I grew up in a go do it. Now, but I was also the child 
My body went, but my heart stayed where I was. And so it took a while to kind of, and so I need you to understand, but it's not that they don't have it. Here's the thing. All of us that confess the name of Christ, we have righteousness. But we measure righteousness based on our own judgment and experience. Some of us judge righteousness because we rebelliously came and followed God and mad at the ones that still out there enjoying where we wish we were. <laughs> but if you get caught up in that, there is a judgmental mindset that come that if people don't align as quick or the way we expect them to, we all of a sudden say that they don't have faith. If someone's struggling, and I want to be real and open, can I be transparent with you all? If someone is struggling with their identity, that doesn't mean that they don't have God. It just means that they're struggling in that particular area. Where they struggle with identity, you struggle with addiction. Where you struggle with addiction, another one struggle with, with anger issues and rage. You got rage just out the blue. You sit up there and cut somebody with your presence. You know, and, and if you get the opportunity, you'll cut them for real. And some of you got promiscuity issues. You ain't got no identity. You just don't have no identity for yourself. So therefore, you give yourself. And so you, but. When you name the name of Christ, it doesn't mean you don't have God. It means that it's taking you a while to get where he's calling you to. So the goal of God is continue with the love of God to get you there. But we bought into that marketing scheme. Because when we fall... It take us longer to forgive ourselves than God done forgave you. He's talking about your day, and you still coming to pray about the forgiveness. God doesn't hang around your downfalls as long as you do. You... Because you feel like because I did not perform here in my faith, I've let God down and therefore not worthy of God. And God is saying, I've forgiven you. Now let's move forward past that. Now, this is not a license to say, do what you want to do. That's not what I'm saying. But the more you love God, the more you find yourself walking away from the things that don't please God. But it's not up to a religion or a pastor or a faith or anything. To t it's your faith and your commitment to God that brings you to the level of satisfaction between you and God. But your relationship is there. Turn to Romans 4. Romans 4, I want to show you how God deals with faith and with righteousness. Because for you to be undeniable, here, here's the problem. If you do not believe that you have God's righteousness, your confidence to stand in God is shaken. Can we say that? And if you feel like you disappointed God, the first thing you're going to do is stop talking to God. Your prayer diminishes. Your pursuit of his presence, because we think we could only pursue his presence when we've been doing everything right. Or in our minds, we think we're doing everything right. Romans 4, verse 5. I want you to look at this. It says, but the people, but people are counted as righteous not because of their work. Underline, not because of their work. But because of their what? Because of their what? 
their faith in God who forgive sinners. We're using righteousness now. Righteousness. Righteousness. That we're standing righteous before God. Not because of the work that we do. But because of the faith that we have. When we accept God and we obtain faith in God, our behavior is not the indicator to God whether we really have faith or not. Uh Uh-oh, some of y'all looking at me funny. Go to Galatians 3. Like Pastor Doc said, some of y'all looking at me funny. I don't like the way you're looking at me. Some of y'all, because here's the thing. I want to free the church from being judge and jury for who's right and who's not. Who has faith and who does not. The man on the street could have more faith than you, and you've been here every week. Because they believe God. Abraham, the father of faith, believed God. So when you believe God, you go to God and whatever you need to ask him and talk to him about, you can rightfully and boldly do that because you have faith in God. Are you getting this? All right. So Galatians 3, verses 6 to 14. I'm not going to read all of it, but part of it I'm going to read. I'm going to read the NLT version. So if you have it, and it says, and in the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Somebody say it loud, faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. Not those that were baptized in all of that stuff. You don't need baptism or the Holy Ghost to be saved because the man on the cross next to Jesus didn't have a chance to get baptized. He said, remember me, I believe you. And the guy on the left said, why you believe in him? He on the same tree with us. And he said to the man, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, baptism is an outward demonstration of what happened on the inside. It is a sacrament of our faith, but it's not necessary to send you to heaven. Does that make sense? But once you accept Jesus Christ, it is encouraged that you show that demonstration because they showed it in the scriptures in the New Testament. Even Jesus was baptized. The Holy Ghost is not the agent of salvation. It is the agent of empowering you so that you can grow in your faith and hold on to your salvation. Does that make sense? You need the Holy Ghost to empower you when your flesh want to say no. What lives on the inside of you empowers you to do the will of God, changes your heart, teaches you about God, and gives you an insatiable desire to be with God. It's the love potion to your salvation. Are you understanding me? It is not only for you to speak in tongues. All of those are manifestation of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Spirit is there to help you in strengthening your faith. That's why if you're not on a cross tonight, hanging, getting ready to die, once you accept Jesus Christ, you need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is what keeps you connected to your faith. Does that make sense? All right. So Galatians 3, verse 7, it says, The real children of Abraham are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures Look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in the sight, in his sight, because of their faith. In verse 8, 
He says, all the nations will be blessed through you, he said to Abraham. So all who put their faith in Christ have the same blessing that Abraham received because of his faith. So that religion that tells you that you're not from Abraham's seed, he wasn't talking to you, that was Old Testament. Right there in the book of Romans, it tells you when you accept Jesus Christ and you obtain the faith, you now have the same blessing that Abraham had. So whatever God told Abraham now belongs to you. This week, the rest of this week, you ought to go back and see everything that God promised Abraham. And everything that he promised Abraham belongs to you. Because, not because you're so perfect, not because, you know, you're sitting up there and you're in the spirit, so to speak. That, that's spooky sometimes. You know, but because of your faith. Let me tell you why I am emphasizing this, because I've seen some people walk away from the from the you know from their faith because they did not feel or demonstrated what appeared to be saved. And they had their deliverance in their hand and the judgment of people make them walk away from their answer. And it took them years to realize that the people that was sitting up there criticizing them for not having it was having their own struggles. They just were good at keeping their struggles in the closet. My job is to empower you. Prophetess's job is to empower you. That I don't care what you're going through. It's just a process to get to where God is calling you to. Sooner or later, you're going to get there because the more you're exposed to God, the more you're going to love him, the more you're going to have a detesting of, of the thing that you should not do, and the more that you'll be more connected to him. Now it's about him, and it ain't about the acts. People are dropping out the church because they're tired of performing. They have real struggles and need to expose themselves to God, and they will not because they think their faith is tied to their performance. So he says in verse 11, so that we're clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say is through faith. That a righteous person has life. Because if you decide to keep the law, you got to keep the whole law. That means you can't wear blended clothes. It's got to be one fabric. So if you got Polly and Esther, that's two people. You can't wear them. <laughs> Cotton and rayon, that's a mixture. You can't wear that. Silk and satin, that's two. You can't wear that. Everything has to be pure 100% that you put on your body. Everything that you eat has to be kosher. Everything that you, that, that you walk, you know, I mean, you got to follow the whole law if you decide that performance is how you get it. Now, Christ removes himself from your life, and now you're left to fend for your own deliverance. got to keep the whole law you got to shave you got to do all of this you got everything that the law says you've got to do that's why he hung on the cross curse is the one that hang it on a tree that's why he hung on the cross so that you don't have to and now all you got to do is receive him and work your way through you need power for addiction, God will give you. I got faith. I believe God. I believe that I will be out of this. I believe. I love God so much. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm going to stay here until he does it. It's faith. That when you have faith, you have the key to everything. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? So, you can read the rest on your own time because um, I need to hurry up. So now we know you cannot practice principles without faith. 
Faith now becomes the sole means to be undeniable. What is faith? Faith is the air to your soul. It is the blood to your life. So how do we do this undeniable faith? How do we get this? I'm going to give you five steps, and then we're going to call it a day. All right? Five steps. Number one, find your faith groove. Establish a routine that feeds your faith, that feeds your spirit. How well fed your spirit is the better source that your faith draws from. Your faith draws from your spirit. So when you feed your faith, your spirit, your faith is strengthened. Does that make sense? Turn off Hot 105, Ricky Smiley Show. Put on podcasts and listen to a song on the way. I'm not, I'm not going to knock, you know, secular radio. That's not what I'm saying. But there are times that you have that you could dedicate to he- feeding your spirit. When we're on the plane, we're either listening to music or we're listening to preaching. Find the time. And if you don't have no time, that, that ride from one place to another, put something in the atmosphere that's going to feed your spirit. I done gone home many a night with tears in my eyes because I heard something in a song that I didn't hear before. So find your faith groove, and you have to establish a routine. I'm not going to tell you, you know, you got to get up at 4 in the morning because early in the morning will I seek thee. Well, the day starts at 6 p.m. in the Jewish religion. So if you want to wake up early in the morning, 6 p.m., start praying. Sundown is the new day. Are, are you understanding me? So don't get into semantics. But find a routine. Get in God's word. You're in a police car, listen to God's word. Listen to, you know, something that will feed your spirit that is faith-based. I say that because there are a lot of resources out there that, uh, you know, appear to be faith-based, but they're not. As a faith preacher, I can't listen to Farrakhan and say I'm feeding my faith. He's motivational. He's not faith-based. The minute you denounced Jesus, you took away my strength, so now I'm left to the law. Number two, dance in uncertainty. You're not dancing in what you don't know. I don't want you to dance blindly in what you don't know. You dance in what you are, has already been proven in your life. So when you dance in your uncertainty, You're dancing about what God has already done for you. Number three, be transparent. You got to call out, deal, and address everywhere you fell short. It's not up to the church to tell you where you fell short. It's up to you to look at where you fell short. Scripture reference for that is Genesis 15, verse 7 and 8 where Abraham did not pretend whatever God said, that he knew what God was talking about. He said, God, how am I going to get all this? Be transparent with God. Don't ignore your shortfalls. Because your shortfalls are key indicators of what you need to feed your spirit next time. Wherever you fell short is an indicator that you need to strengthen. We must become okay with struggling in his presence. I'll say that again. We must be okay with struggling in his presence. I ain't tell you go struggle in front of everybody. Struggle in his presence. Tell him what your shortfalls are. Tell him what you're struggling with in his presence. And I guarantee you, he will answer you. Number four, keep check on your responses. 
For faith to work, you must respond to circumstances with what you believe about God, not how you feel about it. What you believe about God. I remember one night we had uh, a friend that was accompanied with someone that stayed, had to stay the night in our house. R real story, not trying to spook you or anything, but um, the person that was accompanying them had spirits. And they stayed in our, in our son's room. And what ended up happening the next night, my son was in bed and he started screaming and could not rest. Immediately, Issachar over here said, they had spirits. And you could feel the atmosphere. So we're not expert seances and, ex, you, know, ex, you know, exorcist people, but we believe God. So what we did, we got the awe and we swept the room. We prayed, we believed God, and we celebrated him for his presence because he heard our cry. I didn't sit up there and think about, well, I can't, I can't do that because, let me see, at 3 o'clock I did this, at 4 o'clock I, I didn't do too good. No, at that point, I stood on my faith. She stood on her faith. We exercised the room. The baby slept, slept sweet right after that. Sweet sleep. There was peace in the house. Some of y'all need to sweep your own house because you don't know who done brought whatever into your environment. And so, therefore, your, your faith is what you use in order to sweep the environment and make sure that your house is conducive for the presence and the peace of God. Are you hearing me? So you got to check on your responses. We trusted God. Number five, use your faith to the fullest. Faith is not mandatory of God. Faith, let me put it this way, faith is not, you can choose to engage your faith or not. God is not going to force you to use your faith. You have to choose to employ your faith. And when you choose to employ, he answers you every time. If you believe God to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if that's all you know, when you say it, you believe it. He will come through every single time because you know and you believe that he provided for you when you were low. He provided for you when you were down. And he is your shepherd and you shall not want. You've been to the edge and wondered what was going to happen. And he still came through because you believed him, not because you behaved well. Because you came, you believed him, and he came through. So these five things, number one, find your faith groove. Number two, dance in uncertainty. Number three, be transparent. Number four, keep a check on your responses. And number five, use it to the fullest. Stand to your feet.